This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. He's the author of 10 books, including The Party's Over, Peak Everything, and The End of Growth. He's also a driving force and senior fellow at the Post Carbon Institute. You know, I wanted to give Richard Heinberg hell for wasting resources on an eight-pound monster book about wasting resources. The book, Energy, Overdevelopment, and the Delusion of Endless Growth is so big, I had to clear off my desk just to look at it. But then I got sucked in by two-foot photos of the nasty industrial mess that is hiding behind our consumer lifestyle, our cars and our smartphones and all that. Why didn't I know that it's so bad out there? So, Richard Heinberg, welcome back to Radio EcoShock. Good to be talking with you again, Alex. Well, Richard, why did the Post Carbon Institute put all this paper and ink into a play? The book actually is a project that was brought to us by the Foundation for Deep Ecology. Uh, They've produced a a series of similar sort of coffee table-sized books going all the way back to one called Clear Cut, It's a strategy that seems to work well because people actually can see, as you say, with with big color images, the results for the environment of, uh, you know, basically modern industrial life. And, uh, you know, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. So these books are always features of activist campaigns whether it's for CAFO, which was a book that they published a couple of years ago on uh, confined animal feeding operations, or clear-cutting forests or mountaintop removal, coal mining. These books are typically gifted to environmental organizations to use in their activist efforts. So Foundation for Deep Ecology partnered with us on this one and uh, brought us the project sort of half-finished, and then we brought together some of our fellows to uh, flesh out some of the content on uh, energy literacy and so on. And the result is this, (laughs) as you say, big eight-pound bouncing baby of a book. Well, I was really impressed. I was struck. I was moved by the photos. And then I began to wonder, well, why don't we see these images in the media or even in our daily lives? We don't encounter this, you know, acres and acres and acres stretching out to the horizon of, of wrecked land. Do you think the images are censored or is it because we really don't want to look? Well, the images are hard to get in some cases. For example, the uh, the tar sands in Alberta, everybody kind of knows that, you know, it must look pretty nasty producing that stuff, you know, digging into the arboreal forest and tundra to get this gooey bitumen out that has to then be refined and sent through pipelines and so on. But, you know, unless you rent a plane and fly over, you're not going to really get the full picture of it. Certainly the the companies like Suncor that do the mining have no interest in, in publicizing what it really looks like. So, you know, very few people actually have seen it from a, a bird's eye point of view. But if you look at the photo in uh, in the book, it's just, it's a vision of hell. You know, it's a, it's a landscape of absolute, complete devastation and destruction. Yeah, and I, I didn't realize the vast impact of conventional oil and gas production. Tell us, what is energy sprawl and how bad do you think that is? Well, energy sprawl is basically the fact that producing energy takes land. And the the actual footprint of a conventional oil or or natural gas well is pretty small compared to the amount of energy that we get out of the ground. But the the problem is we use such extraordinary amounts of energy that, you know, you start putting together oil well after oil well uh, after thousands of more oil wells and natural gas wells, and pretty soon... You know, here in in the U.S., we're talking about tens and tens of thousands of oil and gas wells. There are parts of the country where basically you can look from horizon to horizon and see nothing but oil wells or gas wells. And these are places typically where not very many people live. So, again, it's it's not a landscape that most people are likely to see. And I think if you start driving down those back roads, you might run into a few security cars and people wondering what the heck you're doing there. So it, it's, That's right. not, it's not easy to get to. Well, we should mention there's also a collection of great essays in the book. You're a contributing author. We're going to hear more from you in a speech that we're going to broadcast later in this program. But would you like to talk about a couple of the other uh, written contributors? 
Well, sure. We're proud to feature essays from uh, quite a a number of energy experts, including Charles Hall, who uh, is one of the originators of the net energy or energy return on energy invested concept, which really transforms our our whole view of energy, the, the economic as well as the environmental costs of energy. There's an essay by James Hansen on uh, coal and climate change. Uh, Wendell Berry uh, has a a wonderful essay called Faustian Economics, Hell Hath No Limits. (laughs) There are uh, essays by Jeff Goodell, Sandra Steingraber, who's one of the great activists working against hydrofracking, David Hughes, who uh, is a post-carbon institute fellow, who is, he's a geologist and one of the world experts on uh, uh, hydrofracking and the and the um, the limits to that technology. Oh, just looking through the the uh, table of contents here. Amory Levins on uh, energy efficiency. Bill McKibben on climate change. These are all the big names, really, in each field, all uh, writing good essays. And I was taken in the paper by that former CIA director, James Woolsey. He says we're ready to spend billions fighting malevolent groups like al-Qaeda, but we're unwilling to even talk about what he calls the malignant threats like the system collapse of things, maybe our electric grid or the climate. But Richard Heinberg, haven't you experienced that unwillingness to look or act for years? Well, sure. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I've been writing about these issues for over a decade now, and uh, clearly there is a small audience out there, relatively small audience of people who get it, who are deeply concerned. As I put it in, in my introduction to the book, energy is at the core of the human predicament in the 21st century. Whether we're talking about climate change, whether we're talking about geopolitics, whether we're talking about the economy, Energy is right at the heart of it. And yet, here we are in 2013 with basically the same energy priorities as in 1990 or 1980 or 1960. Basically, fossil fuels as our primary energy sources, and we have no plan B. We literally have no realistic energy policy in this country, or, and, that's, and the same is true in most countries around the world. We're going in the wrong direction, and we're, and we're hitting the gas pedal as we go. Right, and I noticed in the book, despite the hard-headed figures on world energy sources and things like return on energy investment, which are very important, I was surprised by the photos and essays on the importance of wild places and the species that live there. Is it partly a return to the old environmentalism? Well, you know, partly that reflects the priorities of our partnering organization, the Foundation for Deep Ecology, but also, you know, I th- I think as society becomes more and more urbanized, it's easier and easier for us just to forget the impact of our activities on wild nature. You know, we don't see as much of wild nature as we used to because so many of us live in big cities. And so, you know, out of sight, out of mind. I think it's really important that we be reminded of the incredible beauty of the places that we're losing at an accelerating rate. And I notice along those lines, the flagship website and discussion spot for the Post Carbon Institute has changed from the well-known Energy Bulletin to a completely new site, resilience.org. What does that change mean? Well, resilience.org is hopefully a much more useful and user-friendly site because you can delve into news and essays in uh, several different areas. Uh, For example, energy, economy, environment, food and water, and society. So you can 